Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar Gang Rule and Experiment in Countering Criminal Governance. My name is Barbara Sparrow, uh, Policy Manager at the Innovations for Poverty Action Peru Country Office, and I'll be moderating today's event. Uh, as many of you already know, today's webinar is the first of a webinar series on crime and violence in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, region. As IPA, uh, we are pleased to host uh, this webinar along with our co-hosts at the Becker Friedman Institute at the University of Chicago and Princeton University. Uh, before getting to today's presentation, uh, Michaela Sviacci, uh, Assistant Professor at the University of Princeton and co-organizer of uh, this uh, webinar series, will give an introduction on the crime and violence in LAC uh, webinar and the motivation behind it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Barbara. Hi, everyone. We are actually very happy to start with this new series of webinars that we are based uh, in crime and, Latin, and violence in Latin America. So the idea here of this webinar is started by discussions that we were having with Chris, that uh, we know that crime has been increasing in poor cities in the developing world. And we envision this series of webinars as an opportunity to increase our understanding of these problems and also the organizations that are working behind. In particular, what we are going to try to do is to learn together among academics and policymakers, which policies can work to reduce violence and crime. Therefore, the general structure of how we are thinking about these webinars is to have some research presentation and academic paper, but always to have followed by policy discussion. The idea is to reduce this gap that we see between academic research and policymakers and have a space to discuss evidence that can guide the policymaking. So as a preview of the kind of projects that we are thinking of having, apart from the one that we are going to talk today, is we are planning to invite, for instance, Ben Lessing, who is also a professor in Chicago. He has super interesting work about uh, gang prisons in Brazil. Also, Atriz Magaloni from Stanford University has very interesting work about how the effectiveness of police interventions may vary based on the structure of criminal organizations. Other type of work that we would like to include also in these webinar seminars is work for, uh, that Jorge Tamasho did from Harvard Business School about whether formal employment can reduce participation in criminal organizations. Also, I have some work that I have done myself with a group of colleagues in Central America where we are trying to understand the emergence of gangs in Central America. Also, whether policies like truces can help you know, to reduce violence but may have consequences in the general population. So overall, the goal of this presentation is to provide some insight on how to deal with this problem of violence and crime from the view, not only of researchers, but also policymakers about what kind of things we can do that are uh, relevant for them. So Barbara, I'll let you introduce uh, Santiago and Chris. Uh, well, uh, first I wanted to, uh, well, as Mika said, uh, the motivation behind this webinar is to shed light on this uh, novel uh, research on crime and violence in the LAC region. Uh, in this line, we're really pleased to start this webinar series with a presentation uh, that delves into one of the main issues faced by governments in Latin America and the Caribbean, the fight against organized crime. Uh, the research uh, led by Christopher Gladman, Gustavo Duncan, Benjamin Lessing, and Santiago Tobón uh, centers on an experiment uh, to reduce gang rule in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, the presentation we're gonna uh, share with you today uh, is really interesting as it doesn't just uh, focuses on a strategy, like the impact of a specific strategy to reduce gang rule, but it also explores organized crime and violence uh, and what this implies for policy. And during the presentation, uh, we'll see uh, panelists uh, answer questions, well, look into questions such as what motivates gang rule, how does gangs, uh, how do gangs respond to state and what can governments do to diminish uh, gang rule? 
Uh, today's uh, panelists are uh, deeply immersed on the challenges of fighting criminal governance and from different perspectives. We have researchers, uh, Christopher Blattman and Santiago Tobon. Uh, Christopher Blattman is a uh, Remedy e person professor at Go of Global Conflict at the University of Chicago and is one of the co-organizers of this webinar series. And uh, Gustavo, uh, Santiago Tobon is professor of economics and director of uh, economics of the Center for Research in Economics and Finance at the University of Airfield. We will also have uh, the policy uh, comments of uh, Jairo, uh, Jairo Garcia, uh, who is Deputy Defense Minister for Strategic and Planning at the Government of Colombia. Uh, we will start with, with a presentation uh, on Chris and Sa on Santiago's research, followed by comments of the Deputy Minister uh, Jairo Garcia, and then open the floor uh, to questions from the audience. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question during the event, you can do that through the Q&A function of the Zoom. And uh, please share your name and affiliation uh, if you're comfortable so our panelists uh, know who the question is coming from. Uh, feel free to ask the questions during the, the event and as um, it is unlikely that we'll be answering all of the questions because of time constraints, uh, we apologize in advance. Uh, finally, just to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and uh, we'll be making it available after the event. So uh, please uh, share the link with anyone who uh, colleagues that might be interested in these topics uh, so we can uh, reach more people with this. Uh, well, uh, then uh, Chris, uh, Santiago, uh, start please when you're ready. Okay, you can see my slides now, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mika and Chris, for organizing this, uh, and Barbara also, and Casey, and everyone for making this uh, possible. So, so now we're going to tell you about uh, this project that we started with Chris, uh, Gustavo, uh, and Ben four years ago, more or less, uh, in the city of Medellin, to understand better how gangs interact with citizens uh, and what are these dimensions of criminal governance, which is this uh, phenomenon that has been studied quite a while by mainly like ethnographers and some political scientists, but that we believe that we lack a lot of understanding uh, in order to actually design better policies and to understand better these, these sorts of problems. So, so we're going to study uh, how gangs rule and why gangs rule. Uh, and criminal governance or criminal rule is related to this sort of dimension where gangs go beyond extraction of typical criminal rents and start providing some sort of services such as dispute resolution, security and others, uh, which may or may not be public services or sometimes may be sort of private services, but in the end are dimensions in which we typically expect the government to intervene. So this is what we're studying and we're studying this in the city of Medellin, which I believe most of you uh, no, it's been known for a large history of violence. Now we're in the, I'm from Medellin and I'm here now in Medellin. We're in, uh, in, in, in probably the lowest levels of violence uh, since we have a uh, record. Nonetheless, there are many issues around gangs, gang presence and, and their interaction with, with citizens though, that we will tell you about today. So I'm going to give you the first part of this talk and then I'm going to uh, give the mic to Chris so that he can uh, continue. Uh, so the big picture gangs are strategic actors and I'm going to give you two insights from our study and then two implications. Uh, the first insight is that we find that gangs rule mainly for two reasons. The first one is that governing is a business line, uh, so they provide security in exchange of security fees, for instance. The second one, there are inherent rewards to governing uh, authority, power, can be rewards in themselves for, for gang members. And the third one is that uh, ruling protects gangs from the state. Whenever they the, the, the neighborhood is safer, for instance, 
the state will have fewer reasons to come around. The second insight is that gang rule, uh, uh, contrary to the conventional wisdom, uh, not always is not always a sign of state weakness. Rather, it can be a response to stronger states. So stronger states, for instance, can prohibit certain businesses, such as selling drugs, right? Uh, and then this creates a space uh, for gangs to start regulating. Also, uh, whenever the state is stronger, if gangs need, for instance, to protect themselves from the state, they will have maybe more reasons to actually respond to these states by governing more. So gang rule, not necessarily a sign of state weakness. And the two implications of these uh, insights are first, that it's hard to crowd gangs out of governing. So again, conventional wisdom, our own thinking, the government's thinking is that it, if, if gangs are ruling, then you just need to provide better governing by uh, uh, from the state. But then maybe you will just find out increasing the, 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 the incentives that gangs have to uh, govern, right? And the second implication is that this is not necessarily all bad, right? If the gang, if the state competes with the gang, then the gang will have incentives to actually discipline themselves and to provide better services to the community, to reduce extortion, to reduce violence, and actually to behave better with citizens. Because Loyalty, as we will see, is going to be a very valuable uh, 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 and important issue for gangs that are ruling neighborhoods where the state can actually be able to be strong and compete with them. So here is a map of Medellin. Uh, the black dots are gangs. We started off this project four years ago by interviewing a lot of gang members, a lot of community members to try to understand how the environment was in Medellin. And the first task was to actually conduct a, a census of these gangs. So virtually every low and middle income neighborhood in the city has a local gang that's called usually a combo. So the colors in the map are uh, like rough measures of income levels. You can see that there are black dots all across the board uh, in neighborhoods where uh, we have data on, which are the ones that are not white in the, in the map. Uh, which are the ones that are either uh, non-residential or don't have uh, high income levels. Uh, and we can see that in many places uh, we find gangs. And in most of these places, it's not they're, they're not necessarily low income neighborhoods, but rather just low and mi middle income areas of the city. Uh, in our census, we believe there are roughly 350 combos in the urban perimeter of Medellin. But in the whole metro area, there are probably like 400. All of these combos, or most of them, have well-defined borders, have existed for decades. They, their borders are persistent and don't change a lot over time. Uh, and these gangs that I'm showing you in, the, in this map sell protection and provide public services. So another thing we do, uh, along with these interviews and these census of gangs across the city, was a very large survey representative for all middle income neighborhoods, all low and middle income neighborhoods in Medellin to ask residents about uh, whether the state or the gang intervened whenever uh, they needed someone to solve some sort of issue, right? So we started with all these interviews to try to find out which were these dimensions of governing where gangs actually intervened and then designed an instrument to go and ask residents and shop owners to find out with what was the, the extent to which gangs actually intervened in these sort of dimensions. So we asked about 17 situations that you can see listed here on the left. And then we asked, for instance, a household or, or a resident, if someone is making noise, if your neighbor is making noise, with what frequency would the state intervene? And then we also asked, if your neighbor is making noise, with what frequency would the gang intervene to solve this issue? Uh, and we created in, the, in columns one and three a score, like a frequency score, right? So this frequency score, the frequency score in column one is for the state, and the frequency score in column three is for the gang. These scores go from zero to one. Zero, the actor never intervenes. One, the actor always intervenes. So the first thing that you can see is that all across these 17 situations, the ones that start with HH are the ones that we asked to residents. The ones that start with BIS are the ones that we asked to business owners. Uh, all across these 17 situations, the frequency score for the state is not always one or close to one. 
And the frequency score for the gang is not always zero or close to zero. So in general, both actors intervene along all these situations. What we also did was to estimate the difference across these, 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 these two scores. So in column five, you would find the difference with in, in the frequency score of the state relative to the common, right? So the, these, these data points in, in, in column five are measures that go from minus one to one, where minus one means only the gang intervenes always, and plus one means only the state intervenes always, right? And negative values in this difference mean on average, the gang intervenes more than the state, right? And we have these situations, these 17 situations ranked from the more positive to the more negative. So in like dispute resolution, like domestic violence, someone is making noise, we see that both actors intervene, but it seems that the state is more important on average across all these neighborhoods in the city, right? Because this is more positive here. While on other situations like contract enforcement, like collecting debts, providing security, resolving some sort of uh, 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 street violence and disorder, on average, the gangs seem to be more important than the state across all these neighborhoods. These are roughly 223 neighborhoods across all the city of Medellin, right? And then we also averaged all these scores and situations to produce a governance index. So this governance index is going to be one of the key measures that we're going to be talking about the presentation. This is the, the governance index for the state is the average with which the state intervenes to solve governance issues and protection issues. And the gang index is going to be, or the combo index is going to be the average frequency score for the gang how, on, on how the gang intervenes to resolve all these. And one final and key important point here is this uh, relative, like, like this gang, uh, this governance index of the state relative to the combo. Right? So this is going to be like an aggregate score that's going to go from minus one to one, where minus one is the state is the only one that's important, is the gang that's the only one that's important, and plus one is the state is the only one that's important. And, and this is going to measure the, the frequency with which the state intervenes relative to how frequently the gang intervenes. So we can see that this is slightly positive, so that on average, the state is more important than the gangs, of across all the situations, but not by, by a large extent, right? This is slightly positive, this is close to zero. And this is the average for all 200 and something neighborhoods. If we turn to data neighborhood by neighborhood, our survey was representative for each of, the, of these 223 neighborhoods across Medellin. We can produce this relative governance index for each of the neighborhoods across the city. And here you can see that some neighborhoods are bluish and some neighborhoods are reddish, right? In those neighborhoods that are red, on average, the gangs are more important for all these situations than the state. So these are a large number of, of uh, 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 neighborhoods, as you can see, all across the city and all across income levels. If you remember, these were poorer areas, these were like middle income areas. You can also find in middle income areas uh, reddish neighborhoods, so that the state, the gang seems to be the authority along these dimensions of governance that we're measuring compared to sorry, the state. Santiago, sorry to interrupt. I think that uh, the slides didn't switch. I thought it was my connection, but it seems that it's for other people. We are still in the slide of gang cell protection. Sorry, let me just confirm that. Is it the case for everyone? Yeah, for me too. Yes. Sometimes, uh, if you are you in PowerPoint, if you go out, if before you share your screen, if you go full screen, and then after after you go full screen, you share your screen, it, it you don't have that problem. Yeah, let me just see that. And sorry, I've been um, answering some questions in the chat, but I realize now there's a Q and A button which I've never seen before. Uh, so I'm I'm sorry for not using that. I'm going to switch over to the Q&A function uh, and answer as many as I can, uh, and which might not be all of them. And then Santiago can take over for me. And then we'll have Q&A later on as well. So apologies. I, I, no, I actually, this is a new function for me. 
go go ahead, Santiago. Okay, you're looking now at the map, right? Yeah. Why don't you try advancing one slide just to be sure? Yes, perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mika. Uh, so, so as I was telling you, we can produce this like relative governance score for each of the neighborhoods because our survey is representative at each of these 223 neighborhoods. So you can see here that there are some neighborhoods that are reddish and some neighborhoods that are bluish. Those that are red or reddish are neighborhoods where on average, the gang seems to be more the authority relative to the state for all these situations. And we can see, as I was telling you, that this is not only a matter of income levels. Uh, we had here at the center of the city, for instance, uh, many places were, were just like middle income. And we still have gang presence and we still have some reddish uh, 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 neighborhoods around. So in the end, governing is a decision that gangs make. And we're going to discuss what drives these sort of decisions. We can also see here that there are some neighborhoods Remember that this score goes from minus one to one. There are some neighborhoods, not a lot, but some neighborhoods at the east and west part of the cities, also at the north, where the governance score is rather negative, right? So that in these neighborhoods, it's even more important. It seems that it's even more important that, uh, the, the role that these gangs have on providing security, providing dispute resolution, and providing a lot of services across the, across the, 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 the city or these neighborhoods. And in this survey, we also asked about uh, legitimacy, right? So we, this is a complex uh, uh, concept, but we asked residents whether they trusted this, the, the, the gang, whether they thought their neighbors trusted the gang. And we used these questions to produce a legitimacy index or score. And we can see here that uh, along the, it's here in the, in, the, in the scatter plot that you're looking at, each dot is a neighborhood. And we can see that combos or gangs also enjoy moderate to high levels of legitimacy. And in particular, this is more important in places where they provide more governance services. So if we look at these neighborhoods uh, in the, like to the right and to the uh, 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 upper part of the, of the figure, these are places where not only the gangs are the authority in providing solutions and governance, but also residents feel gangs have the authority to provide these solutions and governance. And to start with, why would gangs do this? What we see is that in part, gangs are providing a differentiated service in exchange for extortion, right? In exchange for a security fee or for a vacuna or vaccine, literally a vaccine, how we call it here in, in, in Colombia. So most of these gangs collect an extortion fee or a security fee every week. Uh, and they do it in exchange for some services that they provide to citizens. And we can see that this is a differentiated service to, this, to, the, to the extent that if you look at the figure, gangs provide, whenever a resident calls the gang, they respond faster than the alcaldia or the mayor's office or the police that gangs are generally easier to contact than mayor's office staff and also a bit than the police. And if you look at the right part of this figure, even though fewer people believe they would be better off without the mayor's office or without the police, 21 and 15%, it's not a majority of people who believe that they would be better off without the gang, right? So a majority of people believe they, would, they are better with the gang. And this is an average for more than two thirds of the city, more than 223 neighborhoods all across the city in middle and low and income neighborhoods. So now I'm going to turn the mic to you, Chris, so that you can continue with the, with the, with the, talking about the, our gang interviews. Great, and I will hand over to you the fire hose of really good questions, which I was uh, unable to, to answer in full, but, but thank you for all those questions. We'll try to get to, to many of them. Okay, so, one of the unique aspects, I think, of this study is that we uh, is that we spent a long time, basically four years, trying initially with very little success, uh, and eventually, you know, eventually finding ways to build contacts within these organizations to talk to people anonymously, safely, and in ways that will protect their identity, um, but also help advance public policy, and 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 how we sort of 
manage that very narrow path is, is, you know, is a story in itself and we'd be happy to talk about it later. But what's the result of that? The result of that is we have about 30 organizations and about 60 to 70 members and leaders of organizations again, from maybe 30 different combos and, and, and of the, some of these more senior level organizations above them that I've talked about in the Q&A, uh, who talk about why they do what they do. And, and one of the subjects in which we've talked to them is why they govern. And, and two that come out that are related is this idea of protection from the state. And, and they're protected from the state partly because the community is less likely to call the police to take care of a combo problem or to complain about a drug business uh, or a drug corner uh, nearby, or if the police seek information from them, they, uh, they may be less likely to co uh, collaborate with the police. And so one tells us, for example, the community shields you according your, to your behavior. If you do not have the community in your hands and your back, you do not have anything. That is what takes care of you. But the combo rule also has a preventative role as well, such that if they're taking uh, so as one tells us, there is a good relationship with the people and it is easier to bring order in the sector and so the police do not have to come around. So basically by taking care of street disorder, by taking care of property crimes, the police are less likely to send in patrols and especially specialized units. And thus they're less likely to either uh, bust a drug corner or disrupt, simply disrupt traffic to that drug corner as people sort of flee because of regularized police presence. And potentially it, it, it reduces the extent to which some police will demand bribes uh, of these from these drug corners. So there's this whole, in some sense, this sort of loyalty and, and police prevention motive. Uh, Sancho, if you could advance to the next slide. They're, they also report, many of them report a whole set of intrinsic benefits and status and sort of moral rectitude and a vision of how their society should be ordered and their role in it. A lot of these organizations have a history fighting the guerrilla or fighting um, uh, urban militias that are associated with uh, leftist insurgencies. And so they think of themselves as the protectors of a right-wing moral order, right? Because one of the things I've learned, you know, whether it's my work with rebel groups or, or gangs here in Chicago or, or in Medellin is everybody has to get up in the morning and tell themselves they're a good person and gang leaders and armed group leaders are no exception. And, and, and so with some degree of like legitimacy in, the, in their neighborhoods, they say things like doing work feels good. Uh, you can have a good heart of your own and we, but you know, we also benefit because the neighbors take care of us, right? So it's intermingled with this loyalty. Uh, or I was always good with the community. No one from the community can say I did something to them. I always took care of them based on principles of helping them. So there's a genuine altruistic motive in many cases that they motivate some of their, their actions. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a business first and foremost, and it's protection for themselves first and foremost, but within at least their immediate community, they're, they're quite concerned. We can, we can advance. Um, you know, if you're interested in the details, I'm gonna talk very in high level about both our theoretical framework, our model, which if those of you are interested, uh, I invite you to see the paper. And I'm gonna just talk briefly about our empirical results. And again, I'm not going to dive into econometric details. I'm gonna give you a very high level sense of how we made, how we tried to estimate the effect of more state presence in these in these neighborhoods and then what the result is. And, and there's a, a paper with all of the gory details that people might want. Uh, but what we do with a model is we sort of take classic industrial organization ideas of duopoly, where you have two, uh, two sellers of governance rather than a, a, a monopolistic seller of, of governance, which is what, of course, many states enjoy. But here, there are two competing sellers. And in general, Industrial organization tells us that when one has some reason, maybe it's a lower cost of providing that service than the other, or a, a, some external desire, like a desire to provide loyalty, or like a, a, an intrinsic desire for loyalty, they'll crowd out the other. And so we, we should, this leads, I think, to the conventional wisdom that gangs emerge from state weakness and that states can strengthen and crowd out gangs. That's very much in line with these classic industrial organization models. But when we introduce these other considerations I've just had on these two slides and we introduce them formally, it's not only possible that that crowding out lessens, but if you value that loyalty and protection or intrinsic benefits enough, and if citizens reward you with loyalty, the more dominant you are as a, as a giver of state services, which may be what happened, it can actually flip. And when the state tries to crowd out the gang, they actually have direct strategic incentives 
and intrinsic incentives to increase their rule. And so whether or not states can crowd out gangs is really an empirical question that may vary from place to place. And so all we're gonna talk about is what happens on average in Medellin, but it, it provides maybe some insights into what effects we think should, might dominate in other cities. Um, so how are we gonna do this? Well, two ways. So first, if Santiago, if you can advance. Um, Here's another map of Medellin. Now our dots that you see here are not combos. The dots are the blocks where we conducted surveys. And on each one of these blocks, we may have five or six surveys, both of residents and businesses. And this means about 25 or 30 per low and middle income barrio. And what you also see is a bunch of black lines, internal borders, which are uh, separates the city into 16 comunas. And these borders were introduced not at the birth of the city, but they were actually redrawn and introduced uh, in the late 1980s. And, and so the dots are gray and red according to their proximity to these, these new borders that appeared in the 1980s at a time when most of these combos existed. And so the ones are, are the neighborhoods within 200 meters of a border. And then the, the, the squares and triangles are city services that are provided at the communal level. Now, many city services like schools and hospitals are not provided at the communal level. You can come from any part of the city or one side of the border or the other and access a school or a hospital. But police patrols are organized within the comuna. Uh, police outreach is organized within the comuna, as is uh, a lot of other municipal services, including family services and especially dispute resolution services, ones that are uh, centered at what are, what are often called uh, casas de justicia, the dispute resolution providers, the squares. And what you can see if you look at the upper right corner and you just look at um, the this sort of middle border, you can see a set of, of communities that are very close on one side of the border to their uh, dispute resolution provider and their police. And you cross over the border, you maybe go 20 meters over or 30 meters over to a, a very similar block on the other side of the border and they're relatively distant from their, their state, their local state, the, the state that's providing these protection services. And on average, when you cross the border from a paired set of, a set of like communities and all you do is, is go 50 meters over to another block, what happens is one of those blocks on average gets about half a kilometer further from its local protection provider through the state. And so there's a drop off in proximity to protection services from the state. And what we're going to do, and, and the econometrics are in the paper, but we're going to exploit that to try to understand what's the effect of, on both state rule and gang rule. And our expectation initially is that state rule would go up. The closer you are to these local providers, the more likely they are to provide their services. And we thought we might see a reverse, we might see then combo rule go down. But as you'll see on the next slide, if you could advance, we see something very different just very high level summary of the results, right? What happens when you move? So at the median, these, these communities are, are half a kilometer more distant from the state. So at the median, when you get half a kilometer more distant from the state, the, your state governance, the, your, the frequency of services you, 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 you uh, receive goes up 20% relative to the control mean, right? So as we'd expect, that's the blue bar. And the state legitimacy goes up 11%. And this is exactly what we anticipate. But the amazing thing is combo rule also goes up. People say the more state rule we experience, the more combo rule we tend to experience, okay? And, and because the only thing that changes at the border, your distance to business agglomerations don't change at the border. Your distance to schools and hospitals don't change at the border. Your distance to anything and your characteristics don't change at the border. The only thing that changes is your proximity to the state. And so this lends a causal interpretation to the impact on combo rule, that this introduction of new borders, the reorganization of state rule, and then the gradual increase and in intensification of protection services by Medellin over the last 30 years has resulted in those neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods have tended to develop greater combo rule. So it's crowded in the combos and it's not crowded out. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. So there's reasons to be, so this has many advantages. It's very long run. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's extremely robust, but there's sort of two disadvantages. One is that it's not, it's not, uh, it's a quite a multi, multifaceted treatment, right? And it's both police and Casas de Justicia and other municipal services. And it's quasi experimental. It's, it's along, it's this border discontinuity where we're fairly confident that this is a causal, we can, this, this, we can interpret this causally, but you're never fully confident. 
And so we, at the same time, ran an experiment uh, with the city. Uh, and what happened was we went to a neighborhood called La Loma, which you see here. And what, what we realized is that the city had decided in this neighborhood of about 10,000 people, they'd assigned four liaisons. So nothing to do with police, they're, they're, they're civilian staff of the city who were there to basically be the face of the state in this neighborhood. There was about four or five of them for four years in a neighborhood of 10,000 people. So maybe one per, uh, per 2,000 roughly. And, uh, and their job was to, um, not to directly confront the combos at all, but to basically provide linkages both to the city's protection services, acting of, as a facilitator sometimes between them and the police, certainly referring them to dispute resolution providers and family services, but just in general, trying to make sure that the good governing gets done. And so they'll be coordinating garbage spot pickup or try to help get a street light repaired. And, and connect people to this vast sort of infrastructure and social apparatus that exists, given that Medellin is a fairly rich and well-funded study with a lot of social services that these people simply weren't connected to. Okay, and qualitatively, this seemed to work. Uh, if you could please advance. And so we went to the mayor and the secretary of the security and we said, you know, you have an, an awfully promising program. And most importantly, there's no direct confrontation of the combo. So you also have like a non-coercive measure because you have all these other crackdowns where we see some evidence that this generates violence. But it's possible here that you have a peaceful way to crowd out the gangs. Because again, we hadn't seen any of these results and we hadn't taken these combo leader mentions of loyalty so seriously that we ever thought it would dominate. And so we suggested, well, why don't you scale this up? And they thought, well, we have the capacity to take this formula of one liaison per 2,000 people and scale it up to about 40 liaisons. So let's pick 40 neighborhoods of about 2,000 people each. Let's make sure they're well spread. Let's make sure they all have a combo presence. And then we'll randomly assign some of them to receive this extra personnel. So everybody gets the normal level of city governance. There are, I think, 16 liaisons for the whole city. So this is going to say, well, let's triple that, let's quadruple that number but the new liaisons will get assigned to a really tight spot. And we're gonna see what happens when we govern really well. And we're basically just gonna to go to our limit to do a really good job and see if that pays off as a, as a proof of concept. If you could advance to the next slide. So what those liaisons do on a day-to-day -day basis for two years is they are, again, organizing community improvement efforts like who picks up uh, the dog excrement on the pavement and where, does the, where do we all agree we're gonna put the garbage? They have weekly quotas for identifying problems to get referred to the municipal agencies for dispute resolution for social services. They're coordinating relationships between the authorities, between the police, so that people have more of a say. Uh, they're a physical face of the state every day, a street level bureaucrat. Um, and they're not, there's no more policing in these communities, but they are trying to educate people about when you call the police versus when you can call any number of other agencies and all of the options available to you. Uh, please advance. Then they also hold a caravana, uh, which is this three day long festival in the streets where all the city agencies come and they talk about their services. And there's balloons, as you can see, there's food and there's music and it's a three day street party. And in many of these neighborhoods, they've, they've never seen a, a street level bureaucrat on their streets before. They certainly never seen this. So it's a very symbolic uh, gesture to sort of say, we're here, we're providing services and, and, and day to day this liaison is here to sort of help you get access to these. So we thought this was an incredibly intensive and promising intervention that really for the first time in these neighborhoods really said the state is here and we're here to solve problems. Uh, so go advance please. So what happens? Well, the opposite of what we expected. Um, relative state governance goes down as they report it. And that goes down partly because people say that the state responds less frequently and the combo responds more frequently when, when, when problems go, go on. Now the state has more legitimacy, um, but all of these numbers are small, right? So um, we, we can sort of take a few lessons away from this. One is that after two years of one of the most intensive governance interventions, uh, which for the most part worked and, and actually delivered, uh, we do not see crowding out, right? We can, we can basically say they did not crowd out people turning to gangs. 
And there's the evidence is actually consistent with maybe the initial beginnings of combo rule increasing strategically. Uh, it's also potentially consistent with people suggesting uh, uh, that, that, you know, essentially the, the difficulty of trying to change people's minds, uh, right, and it, over, over a period of just two years, uh, please advance. So in, in the paper, we talk about a lot of different pieces of evidence and, and a lot of alternative explanations. And I'll just say by way of summary that we sort of favor two of them. One is that we think the combo, there is some evidence of the combo strategically responding, especially in the long run and inklings of it in the short run. But also that in the short run, it's, very, it's clear that it's very difficult to increase awareness of state capacity. So it might actually be that a sustained liaison intervention over five years might actually change our measure, which is when you grab a random person off the street, do they think the state delivers more? That may take time to change. But there's also inklings that if we did that, we might start to see results that look more like our long-term results, which is that the combo responds strategically by increasing its state rule. And so as a result, you get this city, not that where some places are governed by the gang and some places are governed by the state, you just get some places with good governance and some places with less governance. And the places with good governance have both duopolists competing more for the loyalty and attention and all the intrinsic rewards that come from that. And that's very complicated. Uh, next slide, please. So there's sort of some conclusions and I think what some policy implications are. And we're also, and we're working very actively on some of the policy implications, both to measure them, but also to try to develop interventions. So the big thing is just to remember security fees are not the main reason gangs decide to rule. It's a business line, but it's really secondary. And this helps explain why most people in these neighborhoods, only 25% of the people who are paying extortion say it's too high. Most of them are like, it's not so high. It's a reasonable exchange. So they're, if anything, they're, they're undercharging for their services because they're trying to gain these other benefits. And so their direct profit motive is overshadowed by these, these impacts on their other business lines, how it affects the profitability of their drug trade. And so it's gonna be very hard for governments to crowd out gains simply by striving to govern better or simply by cracking down, right? And if anything, those might uh, backfire in the sense of well, they'll benefit civilians potentially in the sense of creating competition for good governance and just making some neighborhoods better governed. Uh, but in the sense of weakening a competitor to the state and trying to establish a monopoly on violence, it's not going to achieve that goal. Um, it's also sort of points to just how, difficulty it, how difficult it is, even with two years and, and a lot of attention, it, how it is to sort of shape this capacity that these sort of, these are big investments that both the state and gang have made over time, which might be also why they're enduring and difficult to eradicate. So it's not gonna be simple as, as simple as simply crowding out these gangs. So what does that mean for a government like Medellin or government facing situations like Medellin? If you can move to our, our last slide. Um, I mean, there's a broader sense in that we have to sort of always, every, any policy measure has to think about the criminal group as a strategic actor and how they're going to act in response, right? Just as you would if you were fighting a conflict. Um, and these policies, in some sense, we have to, the policy toolkit for dealing with urban gangs, especially entrenched ones, is pretty bare. There are not a lot of options. You open that cupboard and you see police crackdowns uh, as a very common one. And that may have effects on the profit margins of these gangs. This may affect other outcomes, um, but it's not necessarily going to affect gang rule. It actually is gonna intensify the competition for the loyalty of civilians in many senses. Making it easier to denounce, which is another measure that's been undertaken, uh, trying to facilitate collective action among merchants and trying to, to compete for their loyalties, which, which are, are, are measures that have, are, have been undertaken in Sicily, for example, are not likely to crowd out gang rule unless it doesn't threaten their rents, right? And so it may only be uh, one of the popular messages about the Sicilian mafia and the New York mafia, for example, is the reason they were able to get crowded out of this space is because their fundamental business lines were in decline and because they were, uh, ruling wasn't fundamental to those business lines. And so they were easy to crowd out. And that's not the case with local drug corners, which was not the business line for the Sicilian or the New York mafia, or at least not their main business line. And so in a, when your business line is rewarded with loyalty and is not in decline, but rather rising, 
uh, you need you need a very different set of policy instruments. And that that's very again, it goes back to this idea of accounting for the incentives of criminal groups. Not all criminal groups are going to respond the same. It's going to depend upon their fundamental interests and and the markets that they're in. Um, gangs may be more responsive to things that reduce their monopoly rents in retail drugs in a, in, a, in a neighborhood like Medellin. To the extent, and we're looking into this, to the extent that a majority of sales are going to a group of like highly priced and elastic, large quantity consumers that we call addicts, then intensive treatment programs might actually be uh, a way to reduce demand for their product in a large way. Legalization of some drugs such as marijuana may also be uh, a way to reduce monopoly rents uh, and weaken them. And, and thus we can rule, not just weaken and strengthen these organizations, but we can rule because of the reduced incentives. Okay. We also think there's some potential to disrupt the way that civilians give loyalty to gangs through social norms marketing that we think would be really interesting. Uh, and, and we're looking into ways to potentially try that either in Medellin or elsewhere. Um, but the warning with this is that the thing that's disciplining the gangs, the reason the gangs are relatively peaceful and treat civilians relatively well compared to many other cities is because they value civilian loyalty. So anything that reduces civilian loyalty to the gangs or reduces their rents might achieve this very important policy objective of reducing the influence of gang rule, but it may have this paradoxical effect or not paradoxical, it may have this un. un unfortunate effect of also making the gangs more likely to be extractive, more extortion and more violence uh, and not disciplining their behavior. And so there's a real difficult policy trade-off uh, for any policymaker who wants to make headway against these organizations. We're gonna pause there for uh, discussion and questions. Um, if we just advance to the next slide, there's innumerable people, uh, team members and, and, and partners and funders to thank. Uh, and and I'll, I'll leave this up while we, while we discuss. Mm -hmm. So I've been trying to answer many questions. Uh, of course, there are some that are still there, but we'll try to approach them all. Um, Barbara, how do you want to go next? Yes, uh, Deputy Minister uh, has, I think he's just connected. Uh, sorry, I was just checking on that. Well, uh, th uh, thank you, President Santiago. I, I think, uh, um, you can hear me, uh, Deputy Minister. Uh, maybe to start with your uh, with your comments. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. I was. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so late. I was precisely having a meeting with the Minister and the Claudia Lopez, the Major of Bogota. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for this uh, invitation. Um, I want to say that uh, the work we've been doing with Santiago for the last few years, uh, having a conversation, a technical conversation. Between uh, Aka and public policy is the most important here is talking about the public security of the problem and i think that's uh, been working in these projects to understand what is going on uh, in the territories so i believe we, we firmly believe in the evidence base for Uh, you see the paper you've been doing and you're presenting today, but not from a security standpoint, but from social standpoint. And uh, we want to keep uh, uh, inviting the universities to do this job together. Uh, actually, when you think about what, we, what we've been doing in Bogota and in Colombia, actually we were presenting today um, 
a new approach or the, the, the approach of uh, having better uh, mobility for the police, understanding hotspots, understanding uh, the way crime moves to the city, understanding the way the gangs or criminal activities work uh, in the territory. So I think, uh, uh, I think what you've been doing is gonna help us to get better results. Uh, and I think we need to have uh, new conversations about these results and we need to have better and quicker approaches to understand what is going on in the territory. So we need, what I wanna say is Santiago is you need to get quicker in the results of the, of the papers. We need to have a, a better, better um, and quicker uh, impact uh, research because we need those results quicker. We don't have time. People, people in the territories, in the cities, in the countries, they want to feel, uh, they want to feel safe. They want to be secure. And I, I'm absolutely convinced that the work you've been doing uh, can be applied, can be applied in public policy, and we can work together in order to get better results. So. Um, again, uh, more than welcome to have this conversation, more than welcome to keep on working together with the national police, with the Minister of Defense of Colombia. We know this is important work and uh, we fully support what you've been doing. Thank you very much, Jairo, for your words. Uh, yes, I guess uh, uh, just like a quick reaction, and Chris, can, you can compliment, just thank you. I know like for you in the government, and especially uh, over these days, it's, it's hard to, to, to be around. So thank you very much for being with us. Um, I agree with you. Uh, sometimes academics take, take more time than, 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 than you need. Uh, I also think that some of these problems are rather more complex than we actually thought before. So, so balancing this trade-off is one of the challenges that we have. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy for what you uh, mentioned. I think we're, we're ready to, to just share in more detail uh, all, all the results with you to think about like broader efforts uh, in other places and, and to actually put some of these results in the, in the policy conversation more upfront. So, so thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank yes, you. Uh, I think, yeah, I think the only thing I'd add is there's a trade-off in that um, I mean, we were lucky in that in terms of the impacts of the intervention, we were able to deliver results to the government within about six weeks of finishing the intervention. So that was, I think, a big success for us. And the problem was that the nature of the intervention was one that took two years. So, you know, quick results is, is super important. It, it, we, have to, we have to be careful that we then prioritize quick fixes. And so, you know, the, the thing that often can drive the length of time to results is the intensity of the intervention. So, so we're, um, so in that, but, but I agree, I think we need to, we, but, but the, the, the point then I think partly becomes, we need to look for opportunities to, while we are studying these longer interventions, we look for short term, quicker fixes that we can also use to gain some of these insights and, and implement those at the same time. And, and this is this is kind of exactly what we're hoping to do. Yep. Great. Uh, well, uh, thank you to uh, uh, Deputy Minister. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chris and uh, Santiago for your comments on, on the policy implications. I, I'm gonna uh, start the Q&A section. Uh, thank you uh, both for answering um, so many questions uh, throughout the event. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start uh, with the first question is uh, to what degree can we expect these findings to generalize elsewhere? Uh, would we expect other types of criminal governments to function similar, similarly or differently? Actually, can I suggest that Mika answers that question? Not, and you can be as kind or as unkind as you like, but given all of your experience in El Salvador, which is a very different context, I think it, it sort of shows both the strengths and, but also the limits. Yes, and I think they can vary based on anything. The last slide that Chris and Santiago showed that depends on the business lines that they have. And that they face, I really like this thing that you guys said that it, there is a trade off if we try, you know, 
to do the increase the state, ca uh, state capacity and maybe this threaten their business lines, which are drugs, and maybe then they move to extortion. And what we are seeing, at least in Central America, for the case of El Salvador, is that that can have even worse consequences because the incentives for the criminal actors in El Salvador is just to increase the, their main business is not that much about drug selling or other illegal activities, as in the case of Medellin. So the consequences there are that we see for development are much worse. And it seems that here in Medellin, so I, I was actually thinking a lot, in Medellin it doesn't seem that it's, they are that violent. So they have presence there, but they are not as predatory as we see with the cases of Central America. So I think that they, they complement very pretty well because I think in other cases, for instance, this is what I'm focusing actually is the case of El Salvador, San Salvador, the city, where you have that the main activity is extortion, but there are certain areas where these guns also do drug selling and drug trafficking. And I think that all these results will externalize to that location. But again, like I was, what I, I take out from this talk is that we always face like these trade-offs. It's like, still we don't know, like at least with this, we learn that things are not that simple. It's not just increasing the number of state actors in these locations to crowd out a uh, criminal governance and then there is this thing is that in which which uh, which type of activities that they do we want you know to push out first which are the ones that generate more damage is it like the illegal drug selling or is it the extortion business so i think all these things we have to take into account when we're thinking in terms of policy but yes and we will see actually i think that another work that relates is the case of police interventions that hopefully Beatriz Magaloni will be able to come and talk, where we see how these police interventions of pacifications in Brazil vary a lot on which are the incentives of these criminal organizations. But of course, all these, there are a lot of similarities among like, these criminal groups, so especially in Latin America, where we see that the main business land are or extortion or drug selling and other businesses. So. Let, let me just jump into yes. uh, uh, Mika's, Mika's answer. I, I believe like in, like for the past 25 years, the aggregate homicide rate, for instance, in Latin America has been more or less the same. Uh, Colombia has improved, but then other countries such as Brazil and Mexico have gotten worse and, and some others in Central America. I guess that broadly, the problem here is that we've been importing policies from the US for the past 20 years, expecting them to work well in Latin America. But we don't really know how these gangs were across Latin America. We really don't know the, like, these, these differences. Like, for instance, Medellin is a city that has been rather studied. There has been a lot of like, research here around like ethnographer work. And, but we actually didn't know a lot of things about these gangs. And, and I, I guess the broader point is that we don't really know a lot. And we need to study more cities such as San Salvador, such as Rio Janeiro, some cities in northern Mexico, uh, Medellin, and other cities in in Colombia to try to understand better, like what are the similarities and differences across these groups and what are the implications for public policy as well. So, so I guess that hopefully there'll be like, this will be like easy to extrapolate to many other places, but, but we're in the process of doing this. And, and perhaps I can thank you again, Mika and Chris for organizing this, because I guess this, 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 web, this series of webinars is also going to help us like put this knowledge together, understand this better. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, another set of questions that we received uh, are related to uh, gang exit, uh, related to how can we incentivize people to leave gangs and if there are any incentives of effective social reintegration processes for former gang members. Um, maybe, maybe I'll take this one just because I spent a lot of my career working on uh reintegration of an exit of rebel group members, which is a much easier problem because when the civil war is over, their main job is done. And, and, and so there, there's a number of people who have difficulty reintegrating, but they all have strong incentives to reintegrate. Here, um, there's a big question of whether or not it even matters, right? So think about, imagine if you are a vegetarian and you don't like burgers and you decide I'm gonna to go to all the people who work at McDonald's and I'm going to give them a job at whatever, a, 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 at Impossible Burgers where we sell like fake meat. Well, that's fine. Maybe all of those people will take your higher wage job and then McDonald's will just go to the labor market and hire a bunch of replacement workers um, because their labor supply is very elastic and they have high labor demand. 
Um, I think gangs face a less elastic labor supply in the in the sense that they're it's, they just can't recruit anybody. They have to worry about loyalty. There's certain skills and connections, and mm -hmm. but but they still have people they can access. So you would need a really really big exit program mm -hmm. in order to uh, really affect their labor supply, uh, and that's fundamentally because there's a big market for burgers. In this case, drugs. And so uh, again, I think it only works if you are going after the burger market by reducing the profitability of burgers. Uh, and if you're not doing that, then I think you're wasting your money, your money uh, to a large extent. You're, you're, just, you're basically just help making it slightly easier to retire and you're making it then easier for a 14 year old to enter. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, well, we're, we're on time, but I, I will ask one final question we, we had. Uh, it's uh, how have other crises in Latin America, like COVID-19 or the Venezuelan migration crisis, impacted uh, gang governance? Santiago, you want to take that one? Yeah, so this is probably a hard one uh, uh, because we don't know a lot. So we know that gangs in Medellin uh it's not very easy to i mean it's easy to enter you're a 12 13 14 year old and you end up being part of the gang uh and this is like a progressive sort of a uh, 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 process uh it, it doesn't happen from one day to the other and also there's a, a lot of value on trust so they don't invite a lot of people to just be part of the gang the there's there, there's no like forced gang recruitment to what we to the extent that we know uh, um, in, in terms of actually forcing someone to be in part of the gang. This has of course happened, and to some extent, if you try to get a 12, 13 year old into the gang, maybe his like bounded rationality would make it seem as it's forced, right? But it's not that they want people that's just forced to be part of the gang. They need to trust the people that's in the gang. So even though there have been like a, this, this uh, 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 large like migration process to Colombia from Venezuela, we don't believe that this is uh, fundamentally changing how gangs in the short term have been shaped because they, they need to trust the people that's part of the gang. And probably someone that's uh, just a newcomer wouldn't, wouldn't be that person. Uh, most of the of gang members, for instance, are from the same neighborhood. So this is a rather rigid labor market. People that's part of a gang is part of the same neighborhood. And, and we have a companion study where we are trying to understand better like this industrial organization of these gangs and we're studying this better there. But we don't have a very good answer to how has uh, uh, migration changed the dynamics in, in these very local gangs. And, and the same thing, just to add of what Santiago was saying, the same thing uh, is seen at least in El Salvador is that when they recruit, it's very local. It's kids that they know, they have seen since they were very little. So they all know each other in the neighborhood. It's not that someone outside that is not from that neighborhood will be easily you know, recruited and they can have access to that. And I think that this is a pattern also that happens not only with gangs, this type of criminal organization. Also, I saw that in, in Peru with narcotraffic is that for you to be part of that, uh, that organization, you need to know someone, you have to build all this trust, you have to be from the same local community that the leaders of those organizations. So, and this is the thing that is important, the work that Santiago and Chris are doing because these gangs are so in there. So this is another external that generate by being in those uh, neighborhoods, even though maybe they may reduce violence, still they are recruiting kids at school and they are affecting the returns to schooling for people that live in those locations. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Micaela. Thanks, Santiago. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Jairo, for uh, your participation uh, today. That's all the time we have, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I well, would like to uh, thank everyone that connected and that participated so actively through, through questions and their comments. And we hope to see you again in later editions of this webinar series. Uh, have a great day, everyone.